I'm going to tell you about my book. I'm going to start it with a little anecdote that this afternoon my wife and I were at the Holocaust Museum. So that's a, a kind of rough preparation for speaking in the evening. But it's appropriate because a lot of the pictures that I saw there reminded me of some pictures that I saw in Finland after I moved there, which were a little bit disturbing to me as well. I knew that Finland had fought as a co-belligerent with the Germans in the Second World War. But nothing, knowing that doesn't really prepare you for seeing things like Nazi flags flying on the main street of the city where you live. Um, I, of course, didn't see those, but if I had been living in Helsinki at about the time I was born and walked out in the street, that's what I would have seen. The other picture here shows German and Finnish generals, two of each, plotting the invasion of the Soviet Union across the Finnish border in 1940. The invasion was in 1941. Those things were in the back of my mind when, in 2009, I published this book, which was a biography of a Finnish industrialist named Pekka Herlin. And the day after it was published, my editor said to me, I saw something in the paper today that you're Jewish. Are you Jewish? And I said, yes. And he said, um, gee, I didn't know that. I said, okay. Um, you might be interested in this book, which I helped to write. The title of that book is Tell Your Children About It. It was written in the early 1990s in response to a, a conference that was called by the Prime Minister of Sweden, who felt that the Nordic countries were not addressing the issues of the Holocaust in the Nordic countries in schools. The children were not learning about what had happened. And I said thank you very much and took the book and went home and began to read. And he had written the part about Finland. So I was particularly interested to see that part, of course. But it started with Norway. And I knew a little about Norway, as, as people coming out of American schools probably do, that during the war there was a quisling government that collaborated with the Nazis, that there was also a resistance movement and a lot of fighting back and forth, but that about half of Norway's Jews were deported to death camps. Then I went on to Denmark. And people tend to know a little bit about Denmark as well, that in their rush to get through Denmark to Norway, the Germans allowed the Danes, who mobilized very quickly and very actively, to get 90% of the Danish Jews out of the country and into Sweden and safety. I got to the part about Finland, I started reading, and he said that these three Finnish Jews, two soldiers and one member of the Women's Auxiliary, had been awarded iron crosses by the Wehrmacht during the war. I said, no. That couldn't have happened. The Wehrmacht didn't award medals to Jews. It killed them. But he said three openly Jewish participants were awarded these medals for bravery. They didn't accept them, of course, but all three of them waited to see whether they were actually going to be handed out before they took off and refused to accept them. And then on the next page, there was a, this picture. And it said that this tent synagogue on the Eastern Front was located next to a German division, the 163rd Division, known as the Engelbrecht Division after its uh, ranking officer. And the Jews from the area would come every Sabbath to participate in services. And the Germans would sometimes come by and look in and 
ask a few questions, but the synagogue was never defiled. The participants were never harmed in any way. And I was completely baffled. I read and read and read. And I said, how could it be that openly Jewish soldiers were treated in a respectful manner by the German army? That just didn't happen. We all know there were some uh, closet Jews or Jews who, who hid their Judaism to be in, in the thought that maybe they would protect their families or something in different armies. But openly Jewish soldiers getting medals from the German army and having a, a, a synagogue on the front. I know the son of the man who set that synagogue up. And he said, that's what happened. I wanted to find out why and how that could possibly be. It took me seven years, and I thought the only way I can really do it is to write about it. Research it and write about it. And I wrote it not for the Finns, but for you. I wanted to be able to tell this story to people who only saw the pictures that I showed in the beginning and said, well, the Finns were on the same side as the Germans, so they must have been bad guys. And in order to do that, I have to tell you more about Finnish history and the history of Finnish Jews than you probably want to hear, but I'll try to do it quickly. Over here. Sweden's over here. Russia's over here. And this is the bottom half of Finland. Except when this map was made, there was no such thing as Finland. For 600 years, until 1808, Finland was simply eight eastern provinces of Sweden. It was part of Sweden. It really, if you were right, making a map in, in Latin, you would put Finlandia. But when talking about it, it was just part of Sweden. In 1808, that changed uh, because although there had been numerous wars over that 600-year period that those eight provinces were part of Sweden, they just went back and forth. One side took some land, the other side came and pushed them back. But in 1808, the, Swedes the, sorry, the Russians came and pushed the Swedes all the way back to where they are today. The picture here, the painting, shows Alexander I, Tsar of, Sweet, of Russia, speaking to the Diet of Porvo, the government, the, the kind of local government uh, that handled local matters in Finland. And what he's saying is, if you will be loyal to me, if you will protect your territory against invasion from Sweden or from Germany and thereby protect our borders, you can keep your laws, your language, your religion, your property, your privileges. That didn't usually happen when somebody conquered territory. Usually they imposed all those things. But the Finns were Protestant, not Eastern Orthodox. They spoke Finnish, not Russian. All of those things, the Russian law was a very primitive law compared to the much more modern Swedish law. So the Finns were delighted. And they said, we would protect you anyway because we don't want anybody attacking through our, prop our land. We're going to protect our own borders. So they had a deal. Loyalty for maintaining the status quo. There was a problem, though, for the Jews, and that was that the old Swedish law, 1686, Swedish church law, said people in, Sw in Sweden could practice any law, that they, any religion that they wanted, so long as it was Protestant. <laughs> No Jews allowed. So at the time Alexander was talking, there could be no Jews in Finland. 
the old Swedish law remained in force. So in fact, for a long time afterwards, the law said no Jews were allowed in that territory, in Finland. Where did the first Jews come from? Well, you probably could figure it out. They came from the Pale of Settlement, that area to which Jews had been driven from starting in 1492, Columbus went west, and Alexand uh, Alexander, um, Isabella and Ferdinand, and the Inquisition pushed the Jews out of Spain and Portugal to the east. And then they were later pushed further east, out of Italy, out of France, many out of Germany. And they traveled to what is now Eastern Central Europe, and they were probably going to keep going, some of them, until Catherine the Great said, wait a minute, we don't want them in Moscow. So she set up a border on the other side. So the Jews were packed into that area, millions of them. Many of them were working as um, administrators on the land or in the businesses of Polish nobility, not very well educated, not able to deal with numbers very well, and not wanting to go out themselves and collect taxes. These were somewhat better educated people who were able to do those things. So that's where they were. They lived in shtetls, in poor communities. Most of them were poor tradesmen, tailors, tanners, carpenters, what have you. Not rich people, not powerful people. They couldn't own land. They couldn't own businesses. They had to do what little they could with their hands to make a living if they were not employed as administrators. administrators. The first Jews that came to Finland were different from the first Jews who came to any other country in Europe, as far as I know. Most Jews who came from one country to another were either escaping oppression or looking for a better life. All of the first Jews who came to Finland were brought by the Russian army. Nicholas I had changed the old law, which Peter the, First, Peter the Great had set up, saying that no Jews were allowed in the army. Nicholas decided the Jews could be drafted into the army. He said they'll never be good soldiers, but if we take them young enough and take them far enough away from home, we might make them forget that they're Jewish. We might be able to convert them. So he required each of the uh, recruitment cantons, they were called, to produce 50 Jewish boys between the ages of 9 and 12. Why that young? Because at 13 they were no longer boys. They were full members of the congregation. So these young boys were taken and in many cases were kidnapped by bounty hunters who wanted to get the extra money from turning them over to the army. They were taken and they were marched as far away as Kazakhstan or, or Siberia to what were called Cantonist schools because of the Cantons. And the Cantonist schools was really a misnomer. They certainly were not schools because they were not being taught. They were basically being forcibly converted and at the same time forced to do some grunt work for the army. Once they turned 18, they began serving a compulsory 25 years in the Russian army. So do the math. If you're taking at 10, you go to Cantonist school till you're 18. You then spend another 25 years in the army. You'd be 43, 44 years old. You wouldn't know where your home was. You wouldn't know if anybody was still alive in the little village you had grown up in. You were lost. 
The first soldiers who, the first Jews who came to Finland were soldiers like that. They were in the army, they were in garrisons, they didn't have much interaction with the Finnish people. And then came the Crimean War. And Russia got whomped. They lost the war. They lost their position as the gendarme of Europe. They were forced to rethink their entire position in terms of their empire. And one of the first things that Alexander II did in 1858 was to say, 25 years is too long. Cut it back to 12. Let anybody who served 12 years out of the army and they can settle wherever they were serving. And he forgot to say, except for the Jews. <laughs> so here you have Finland where Jews were not allowed to live and Jews being dumped out of the army onto the street with no real possessions, no money, couldn't speak Finnish. Their language was Yiddish, spoke some Russian. They were in a completely lost kind of situation, and that's why I call them strangers in a stranger land, title of my book. What kind of place did they come to? What was Finland like in the mid-19th century? It was an agrarian economy and a fairly primitive one. 95% of the people lived in the countryside. Worked the land, they had to clear, it was, it, it was either forested land where they had to cut the trees, clear the brush, pull the stumps to try and farm, or it was swampland that they had to drain and then try and turn into farmland. Really rough existence, it was a very poor country. The Jews, on the other hand, had come from villages. They were not allowed to own land. They knew nothing about farming. Maybe they could grow a couple of beans, but they were not going to make a living as farmers. They couldn't own a farm anyway. They couldn't own a business. They couldn't go into industry. The only thing they really were allowed to do and uh, I should point out that there was never any anti-Semitic legislation saying Jews couldn't do these things. The legislation said foreigners couldn't do these things. So it applied to any foreigners who were in Finland. Basically, all they could do, they could pick berries and mushrooms, but they couldn't go out of the urban areas really into the countryside. That was forbidden. So that wasn't going to happen. They could bake bread or things like that. But most of them ended up on the market square buying, reconditioning, and selling used clothing. They were not high-end tailors. They were selling reconditioned clothing, which they bought from people who were willing to sell to them. And they would set up their own parts of the market, the open market, these little booths, and it was called Narinka. During the first 50 or so years, when Finland was an autonomous grand duchy of the Russian Empire, the Tsar had the loyalty of the people. And his desire was to pull them away from Sweden, away from the Swedish culture, the Swedish language, from their ties to the Swedish monarchy. About the middle of the century, they had already begun to have their own currency, their own postal system. There, there was even a customs border with Russia along the, the Russian border. And the Russians looked at that and said, wait a minute, you mean we can't go into part of our own country and pay with our own money, or we can't send a letter home with our own 
postage stamps? That's not right. The Jews on the, the Jews, sorry, the Finns on the other hand, looked at the situation and they said in the words of one uh, famous patriot, we're no longer Swedes, we don't want to be Russians, let's be Finns. But what did it mean? It was a place without a history. There was no such thing as a Finnish history book. It was a place without an art museum or a, a, a literature of its own. It was a people that really had to be made. That they had to get together and they had to decide we're going to take what we can out of the common culture of the way in which people do things every day and turn that into a nation. The Russians, of course, took one look at that and said, um, you may think so, but you're still Russian and you're going to do what we say. And we started a, a, a period of increasing repression. Higher taxes, forcible conscription, all the kinds of things that a country does when it wants to tighten the grip on one of its, uh, one of its peoples. For the Jews, the situation was pretty tough. They were selling things on the market square. They had to renew residence permits every three months. They couldn't go out of a few cities. Sweden had had a law that said that, that Jews could only live in Stockholm, Nürnberg, and, and Gothenburg. And the Finns copied that and said they could only live in Turku, Helsinki, and Vipuri. Now, it wasn't such a bad law because, in fact, the Jews who had been released from the army in little garrison towns up in the north they couldn't get a minion together to hold a service. They needed to come anyway to where the other Jews were, so they came to the cities pretty readily. The government was happy because they wanted to keep an eye on them because they felt they were not Finns. They were not citizens. They were not allowed to apply for citizenship. But as hard as that may have been, as a friend of mine who was the uh, who is a teacher at the Jewish school in Helsinki said they never had to worry about a knock in the middle of the night on the front door or the back door. There was never any violent anti-Semitism. There were never any pogroms as there were all throughout the pale in the last years of the 19th century. So those Jews who had been kidnapped from their homes may in fact have been saved from murder by being in Finland because none of the Jews was ever murdered in Finland for being Jewish. And in fact, here in 1906, a year after the failed Russian Revolution of 1905, the third Russian Zionist Congress was held in Helsinki because it couldn't be held in Russia. It was too dangerous. So they came to Helsinki, which was a more stable environment in the autonomous Grand Duchy. But of course, there was some anti-Semitism. And the anti-Semitism was of the kind that you still find today. It, a kind of people saying, oh, the Jews want to do this. They want to take over. They want to control everything. They want all the money. It had nothing to do with these little peasants in Finland. Nothing whatsoever. They, there was no way in which anybody could look at them and say they were trying to take control of the economy or of the, the government. These comments were coming from people who probably never met a Jew in, in their entire lives. But because this stuff was going around in Russia, the, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was published in Russia. The, um, the Germans and the French, the Dreyfus Affair was going on. There was plenty of talk like this. So of course, some people in Finland talked like it as well. But it never reached a point where anything was done about it. There were never any laws passed. There was never, it never came close to that. The government never bought into it. 
nor did the majority of the people. Most of the people who had anything to do with Jews felt that they were providing a good service by refinishing, refurbishing these um, the used clothes that, that they needed because people were moving to the cities and they long, no longer made their own clothes as they did in the countryside and they couldn't afford to go to the fancy tailors whose prices were too high. So most of them felt things were, were perfectly okay. Now, strange things were happening. Remember, no Jews were allowed to live in Finland. That meant, of course, that there could be no Jewish congregations, there could be no Jewish services held. 1901, the city of Helsinki gave a plot of land to the non-existent congregation to build a synagogue. They said, you have to finish it in five years, which they did. And when it was ready, all of the high government officials from Finland came to the opening. Six years later, the other two cities, Turku and Vipuri, also had really fine synagogues. How did this happen? It happened because the Russians and the Finns all the time were trying to show which one was the boss. So if there was something that was in Finnish law that you couldn't do, the Jews would go to the Russians and say, hey, our grandfathers were soldiers, our fathers were soldiers in your army, we were loyal to you, and now the Finns are bothering us. Tell them to stop this. And the Russians would say, okay, this is a chance to show the Finns what we think. And if the Russians did something, the Jews would go to the Finns and say, hey, we've been living here for a long time. We don't cause any trouble. We pay our, our uh, residence permits and things. Please tell the Russians to give us a break. And they would do it. So they had this funny situation where the Jews learned to navigate through that morass. And little by little, some of them began to get off the market square and into the middle class. The main way of doing this was that um, the first kind of ready-to-wear clothing had begun to be developed. It started off that the first ready-to-wear clothing was made for the military. In the old days, you, if you were a soldier, you had to go to a tailor and get your uniform made. But that wasn't practical when they started drafting lots of people. So they had to start making underwear and, and uniforms and all the rest of it. And then when the military was cut back, there was excess capacity. And those tailors, some of whom were Jewish, started looking around and saying, maybe if we made some things that were a little nicer than the used things that we fixed up, people would buy them. So they began to develop a trade in ready to wear and they were able to get some more money in. But they still couldn't open shops in their own name. If they wanted to have a shop, they had to go find a Finn who was willing to sign the contract, put his name on the sign outside the door, but then they would go in and run the business. Along came World War I, and things got tough for everybody in Finland. The Baltic was closed off because it was fighting on it between the Germans and the Russians. So no exporting to the West. And then in 1917, the Russian border was closed off. Russian Revolution, and it was completely sealed. So they couldn't export to the west or the south through the sea. They couldn't export to the east, to Russia. The only place they could export to was Sweden. But Sweden makes all the same things that Finland does. So they didn't need any of it. So the economy really took a nosedive. And with it, those Jews had come up into the middle class. Many of them lost their money and had to start all over. But there was a silver lining. And that silver lining was that the Finns looked across the border and they said, 
the Russians seemed to be pretty busy fighting each other. They'd even taken most of their soldiers home from the garrisons in Finland to fight on the white side. And the few who were left in Finland weren't particularly interested in Finland, what was happening there. They were more interested in what was going on back home. So the Finns said, guess what? We're independent. Didn't have to fire a shot. Just announced on December 6th, 1917, we're the Republic of Finland. However, what followed was not so easy and not so pretty. Because the same kind of fight between the landless peasants and exploited industrial workers, on the one hand, the Reds, and the landowners, industrialists, students, on the other hand, the whites, broke out and there was a three and a half month civil war. Bloody, nasty civil war. It usually wasn't brother against brother because the issue was an economic one, so the brothers probably were either in the upper or the lower group. But it divided villages, it divided the whole country in half. At the end of the, the war, in the spring of 1918, there were 20,000 dead, 30,000 of the Reds had either fled or been forced across the border into Russia, which was now the Soviet Union, and 80,000 were captured and were in prison camps that were pretty awful. 18% of those in those prison camps died, some from starvation, some from execution, but a lot of them from the Spanish flu. After the Civil War, remember we have a country that had just proclaimed independence and for the first four months of independence it hadn't been able to do a thing. It was too busy fighting itself. At the end of that period, there was a real need to start building that country, that country that was only kind of imagined. But in order to do that, they had to bring people back together. They had to find a way to put Humpty Dumpty back into its shell. For the Jews, a strange thing happened. 1909, a uh, proposed piece of legislation said foreigners should be able to apply for citizenship. But in 1909, it couldn't become a law unless the Tsar signed it, and he never did. In 1918, the same law was passed very quickly among the first bits of legislation by the Finnish government. In any history book, you will see that the Romanians and the Finns were the last countries in Europe to allow Jews to apply for citizenship. But if you look at it the other way, among the first things they did when they can make their own decisions, the Finns made it possible for foreigners, including the Jews in their midst, to apply for citizenship. And by 1920, there were the first Jewish citizens of Finland. With that, the Jewish communities began to flourish. They began to do all the things that Jewish communities tend to do any place in the world when they have the opportunity. They started to have sports teams, they started to have uh, cultural societies, choral societies, Yiddish theater, community centers, even Jewish schools. They were very much inward looking. First of all, it was a very orthodox group. So they had to live very near the synagogues because in Finland, the winters are pretty rough. You don't want to walk many miles to go to shul on a Sabbath. So they were all living in the same place. All of these activities were internal activities to the Jewish community. They still didn't feel very confident going out and spreading into the larger community to do all kinds of things. Business was the only 
point of interaction for many of them. But business they did. Finland was starting to get wealthier. Through the export of lumber, paper, and pulp, they were able to get up to the point where they were about the median of European economic development. They were no longer a poor country. They weren't a rich country, but they were doing much better. They were also beginning to urbanize. People were moving down to the cities. Cities, this is 1906, they already had trams. They had multi-story stone buildings with indoor plumbing and electricity. And of course, the Jews had stores with their own names on the front. Mr. Rabinowitz here didn't have to have the name Valkonen on his storefront. He was able to open a store in his own name. But as the 20s wore on and approached the 30s, the same radical tendencies that were sweeping throughout Europe and were also present in this country, if any of you remember, were seen. Communist Party was trying to hook up with the Finns and the Reds who had been driven out of the country and overthrow the government. There was a fascist movement that wanted to return the country to some imaginary uh, monarchist past. The difference between Finland and all the other countries of Europe is that this never happened. Leaders on the left and the right stepped in and said, that's not the way we do things here. This is a socialist prime minister who was called upon when the president was ill on the 10th anniversary of the white victory in the Civil War was called on to review the, the white army, which was now the Finnish army, because it was the victorious army in that war. The white army was anathema to the left. He said, let's get over it. Ten years, that's enough. It's my job to go review the troops. I'll do that, and I'll take the weight for it. 1932, President Svinhufvud heard that there was an armed insurrection where about a thousand ultra-right members of the Lapua League, the Lapua movement, had gone to disrupt a meeting at a socialist hall, a kind of workers' hall in the countryside, armed group. And he called the leader and he said, go on the radio and tell those guys to put down their guns and go home. And the leader said, not on your life. We're not putting our guns down until this government changes. We want all the socialists out of the government. We want a right-wing government in the country. Sven Hufud, who was a longtime member of the white group, he had marched with them in, the, in parades in the past, and he was, he was well known to them. He got on the radio and he said, put your guns down and go home. You know who I am, you know what my politics are. This isn't right. And they did. And as a result of acts like that, the country pulled back towards the center. The Communist Party was outlawed. The fascists were outlawed. There was still a parliamentary left and a parliamentary right but they were committed to working through parliamentary means, not through extra-parliamentary means. The three leaders who became the most important leaders in my mind as the war approached, the Second World War approached, one was an um, aristocrat from a wealthy family. He'd been for 30 years an officer in the Russian army. He had been a monarchist, and he was the one who rebuilt the army and prepared for the war. Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim. On the left, Weiner Tanner, one of the original members of the Socialist Party, 
in Finland, founder of the co-op movement, minister for many years in many different roles, son of a brakeman on a railway. And in the middle, Risto Ryti, who was president for most of the wartime, before that, head of the Bank of Finland for nine years or eight years, son of a gentleman farmer and a kind of progressive liberal. Those three guys put aside whatever ide ideological commitments they had and said what we need to do is to bring everybody together because we're at risk. We've got the Soviets on one side, we've got the Germans down below, and we have to be ready to defend ourselves and to have a society that will include everybody so that they will want to defend themselves. As a result of that approach, the Jews now felt a little more able to go out of their small groups and to show their talents in other ways. So you had the first lawyer, the first doctor, you had musicians, you had entertainers of different kinds, you had athletes. You didn't have to be just within your own little group. You could become a kind of important person in the society at large, and you didn't have to walk with your head down and make sure that nobody was going to notice who you were. You could, in fact, become quite famous on your own. Had Olympic medalists and, and very popular artists and important people in many different positions during the 30s already. Oh. Finland, let's make sure I didn't, no, I did skip one. As the war got closer, some very disturbing signals began to come to the attention of the Jews. First of all, Finland was the last country in Europe that had a visa-free travel arrangement with one of the countries in Central Europe, with Austria. This was important because Jews were getting their, their passports stamped with a big red J, and most countries would not take them. Those Jews could go to Austria, come to Finland, and from there, most of them were trying to go to the United States or to Palestine or to South America, somewhere else. They weren't really interested in settling in Finland, but that was the port of, uh, of passage to the West or the South. 1938, Minister of the Interior, Kekkonen, who later became president of Finland, longtime president, came to the harbor and turned away a ship full of refugees. They went back to Stetten in Germany. And the likelihood is that all of them were lost. Three of them jumped overboard on the way rather than return to Germany. And after that, no refugees were allowed into Finland. There had been about 550 altogether who came through, and about 350 were still there at the time of the war. Down here, 1939, Tokyo had been originally awarded the Olympics for 1940. But by this time, there was a war in the East. And so the Olympic Committee took away the offer and gave it to Helsinki. Helsinki had built a lovely stadium. It's just been renovated. And they had a, a meet to open it. And at that meet, I don't know how well you can see the picture, but Abraham Tokatsir, who is here, finished fourth in the 100-yard dash. See it? Clearly did not finish fourth. He won that race. They announced he finished fourth. The next day in the papers, in the main papers, 
They showed this picture. They said there was a mistake. He didn't finish fourth. He finished first. That mistake was corrected two years ago. The Finnish Sports Federation finally said, okay, we've said all along you can't undo old results, but that's ridiculous, and they apologized to the Jewish community two years ago. The Jews of Finland looked at that and said, what's going on? Were there some German officials in the stands? Did the government want to make sure that the wrong message was not sent to the Germans, that a Jew could win a race like that? And the next year, when the Olympics in Finland were also canceled, a three-country meet was organized with Sweden and Germany. And by that time, it was quite clear what the message was. You can see here a number of Nazi salutes being given in the stands in back of the German Minister for Sport. World War II was just one war in most places. In Finland, it was three. Some of you have heard of the Winter War. Three and a half month long war. Started 26th of November, a Russian, um, some kind of platoon, was shelled at the border at Mainila. The Russians said, the Finns have attacked us. He didn't explain why a country of three and a half million would attack a country of 160 million. But they insisted that's what happened. We know today that they had sent an artillery uh, unit of their own to shell their own people, kill four of their own soldiers, wounded nine, we know the name of the, the man who led it. We know the names of the other soldiers. Complete fabrication and provocation. They were, not too long after that, thrown out of the League of Nations for doing that. That didn't help. On November 30th, 1939, they bombed 16 Finnish cities and sent troops over the border with marching orders and a guidebook that Stalin had printed, which said that they would march across Finland in two weeks, reach the Swedish border, and be sure not to cross the Swedish border or violate that. They didn't want to offend the Swedes. But in two weeks, they would, they would wipe out Finland. Well, they fought for three and a half years, three and a half months, excuse me, and they only got a little ways into Finland. But they did manage pretty much to exhaust Finland's food, ammunition, and men. At the end of three and a half months, for, year, for reasons that are not entirely clear, Stalin agreed to a truce. It's a good thing he did because Finland probably could not have held out much longer. Where was the help? Finland did not expect to be able to fight off Russia. They were only trying to hold them off long enough for help to come from the West. Help never came, and we'll see shortly one of the reasons why. During the 19th century, when the Jews were trying to get citizenship status and failing, they said, <coughs> We are getting old. We were soldiers in the Russian army, but our children were born here and our grandchildren. If you will give them citizenship, we are sure that they will fulfill their duty as diligent and faithful citizens when called upon. And in the Winter War, they did. As far as I know, all the Jews who were called up to fight in the Winter War went. There were many reasons for it, but one is surely 
that the entire congregation had, of, of each of the cities had gotten together and said to the soldiers, you really have to go. This is our chance to prove that we are loyal citizens and we can't afford to give any of those who don't like us the opportunity to say, see, they said they'd be loyal, but they're not. So all of them went and they in fact paid a heavy price. 15 of the Jewish soldiers fell in the Winter War. You can see those graves have just recently been filled. They're not completely completed. They're not, the headstones have not been laid. That was the highest percentage of any group in the population to fall in the war. This picture is from the Independence Day memorial service at the Jewish cemetery in Helsinki in 1940. At the end of the war, Russia demanded 11% of the land of Finland, which meant that 12% of the population had to be relocated in the 89% that was left. Now, once again, there was war going on in the Baltic. There was an enemy to the east. They needed food. They needed to export so that they could rebuild their economy, and they couldn't do it. It was a very difficult situation. And they called the peace an interim peace because they were sure that the Russians were going to come again. Here you can see what the situation looked like. To the east, everything that's red or pink controlled by the Soviet Union. Already in 1941, everything that's brown controlled by the Germans. What was Finland to do? Again, it had almost no food. It had no ammunition. It had, didn't have enough guns for all its soldiers, and its soldiers were all at home trying to get their farms together, and they were exhausted. In the midst of that, the Germans secretly sent an officer to the military headquarters in Finland saying, we will provide you with, we will sell you food and ammunition, food and weapons, in return for the right of passage of our soldiers up here to northern Norway. So we can get them quickly by sailing up here, getting off at Vasa, and then they only had to take the train up there to reprovision their troops. Mannerheim said, we need food, we need munitions and, and arms, and if there are Germans moving back and forth, German soldiers moving back and forth on our land, maybe the Russians won't be so quick to invade because that will get them immediately into a fight. So the Finns agreed to that and that led to the picture I had showed you originally of the two generals from each side plotting the attack known as Operation Barbarossa which occurred all along this border all the way down here in June of 1941. So the Finns saying all the time that they were neutral were in fact beginning to be involved in planning for Operation Barbarossa. The war that came in June 1941, the Finns called the Continuation War because they said it was just a continuation of the Winter War. It had never really been settled and this was what they expected. Picture on the left. Mannerheim's 75th birthday, Hitler, who almost never traveled outside of Germany during the war, pops up unexpectedly, flies into Imatra, and comes to congratulate Mannerheim on his birthday. By all reports, Mannerheim was pretty much embarrassed, but he couldn't do anything but accept it. The other picture shows Himmler, 
Heinrich Himmler in the back, being rowed across a lake in southern Finland by the foreign minister of Finland. Those kinds of things obviously made it pretty uncomfortable for the Jewish community of Finland. Those were not the only signs. During the war, the Jews were often called upon to translate between Finnish and German officers. Why? Because their native language was Yiddish. There are several stories in my book of, of uh, one of these translation or, or interpreting sessions. And at the end of it, the German officer turning to the Jewish soldier who had been forced to do this translation and who was very uncomfortable in that situation and saying, you know, you speak quite good German, but you have a funny accent. Why is that? He would say, well, actually my native language is Yiddish and I'm a Jew. And the officer would jump, but they never did anything. Samuel Maslovat, who was the son of the rabbi of, of Vipuri, said, my thinking went like this. If Germany wins and we are destroyed, Germany would direct its hate only at the Jews and the gypsies and the like. But should Russia win, it would be a disaster for the whole country. Then we would be equal. I've had a kind of way of saying it that, that is a little like flipping a coin and saying, heads you win and tails I lose. But should the coin land on its edge and stand, then we would all survive. And that was the situation for the Jews, but also for Finland as a whole. Terrible risk to the whole country, but also existentially to the Finnish, pop, Finnish Jewish population. Now, during this entire war, not a single member of the Finnish Jewish population, the citizens of Finland who were Jewish, not a single one was deported, not a single one was hurt, except those who died in battle, and they died from Russian bullets, not from German bullets. But there was one severe stain on Finland's reputation, and it had to do with eight of the asylum seekers who were still in Finland. Remember I said there were a couple of hundred asylum seekers still in Finland at the time of the war. And the state police, which was one of the little nests of uh, pro-Nazi uh, sympathizers, wanted to get some points with the Gestapo. There was no Gestapo in Finland, but they were in Estonia, right across the sea. And so they rounded up one day about 30 criminals, eight of whom were Jewish. These criminals were people whose worst offenses were things like not having renewed their residence permits exactly on time or things like that. But they, had, they were all somehow uh, on the list. You can see that one of them was one year old. His not a big criminal. They brought them in on Friday night to the central police headquarters in Helsinki and tried to hurry them onto a ship the next morning. The Helsinki Jewish community heard about it and rushed to find someone who could stop it. What they discovered was that most of the leaders of the country were out in the countryside and were not in Helsinki. But they found the ranking minister who was still there and they said, you've got to stop this. He went and said, okay, they say this is a police action. I'm not in charge of the police. I can't really countermand this, this uh, 
action, but I can delay it until the, the appropriate people, the appropriate ministers and president come back. The next Monday, when everyone was back in Helsinki, they met behind closed doors and thrashed this out. The Minister of the Interior, who was also very much a Germanophile, said, if you overstep my territory and countermand the orders of my state police head, I will resign, my party will leave the coalition, and the government will fall. 1942, in the middle of a war. The decision was made that, okay, this is a police action. We won't stop it. But only on the condition that this is the last time, that never again do you try to deport any Jews to German-held territory from Finland. Those eight were sent to Auschwitz. Seven of them were murdered. Georg Kohlmann survived because he was strong enough to work, and they sent him to a work detail instead. Those Stolperstein, which are the commemoration plaques that are put in front of the homes of Jews who were taken to death camps and <coughs> murdered, which you find all throughout Europe now, are in Helsinki quite near my office. The third war was called the Lapland War. After it was clear that the Germans were defeated, not totally, but that they could not really recover, they began withdrawing. The Soviets again agreed to a peace with the Finns on the condition that they drive the Germans out of Finland. Finns weren't too excited about doing that. They had been fighting alongside the Germans up to that point, and the Germans certainly weren't very happy with it, but the Finns were not going to allow the Soviets to come into Finland to do the job for them. So they agreed to do it. As they drove the Germans out, the Germans laid waste to everything in Lapland, burned down all the towns and cities that they went through. No Jews in the Finnish army were killed in that war, partly because the officers realized by this time they really shouldn't let the Jews be up on the front line. They didn't want to have any more international incidents. 1944, the Lapland War was still going on. President Mannerheim, he was now president, was supposed to go and deliver the Independence Day address to the entire nation from a big exhibition hall in Helsinki. Instead, he sent one of his ministers and he went to the Helsinki synagogue and presented a wreath in commemoration of the sacrifice of the Jewish community, which had lost 23 soldiers. If you ask any of the Jews in Helsinki today or in Finland, they will tell you Mannerheim loved us. He saved us. He said, over my dead body, will you touch any of the Jews? I think what he said was, over my dead body, will you take anybody from my country? He realized that with a small population in a small country, everyone had to buy into the fight. It was the only possible way they could defend themselves. And if one group felt that they were not going to be included and protected, then every group would begin to wonder who's next. You know the saying, I was, you know, they came for a socialist and I was not a socialist, so I didn't do anything. And then they came for, and on and on, and then they came for me and there was nobody to help. So, same thing, everybody either all in or suffer the consequences. The other thing I think he was doing was he was talking to us. He was saying, after the war, I realized that countries will be viewed 
to a large extent by how they treated their Jewish population. And I'm coming to show you the world that we were not Nazi sympathizers. We were fighting for our own sovereignty, for our own independence, and we were fighting alongside the Germans because the enemy of your enemy is your co-belligerent, but not because we love the Nazi cause. Here are the figures from Yad Vashem showing how many Jews were murdered from each of the populations of Europe, the, the combatant populations. I somewhat provocatively write in my book that the, Jew, that the Finns were the only ones who did not have any of their citizens deported or murdered. The Bulgarians argue that they also didn't. And in a technical sense, that's true. They did protect all of their citizens. But the Bulgarians were also responsible for the deportation of 11,000 Jews from Thrace and Macedonia. 11,000. So I consider their claim a bit of a technicality, and I don't respect it. Finland has those seven asylum seekers who were killed, but none of its own citizens. I've given you a pretty heavy dose of, of history now, and that's behind us. Um, but my book is, in fact, a novel. It has all of this historical context, because I don't think you had the context previously with which to be able to understand what was happening in the novel. And it's a novel because I believe that we learn by identifying with characters. Anybody know who that is? Uh, yes. Yo, there's one person in every audience who knows it's Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederate States of America pretty important person in American history, right? Anybody know who these guys are? Yeah. <laughs> How do we learn our history? How do we remember our history? How many of us actually remember the things we learned in our school books in that way? We learn them and then we have to be able to attach them to things that are emotionally important to us. So I wanted, I, at the time I started researching this book, I spent seven years doing it, but there were only a handful of Jewish war veterans from the war still alive. And I didn't feel any of them could carry individually the weight of this whole story. I wanted to put things together. In my book, if I say that one of the characters, who was clearly fictional, was working in a tailor shop at this address at this time in this city, and this was his boss, you can be sure that there was such a tailor shop and there was such a boss, and that it was possible that he could have been working there at that time. But he obviously wasn't because he didn't exist. So I tried to make a, uh, a structure that is accurate and rigorous, but within that, I put these characters. And I did not have them having long conversations with people who actually existed. It's only one case where there's a little conversation between a fictional and a real character. Um, I, one thing I really can't stand is to pick up a book and have it say, Abraham Lincoln was sitting in his study alone, and he thought, how do you know what he thought if he was sitting alone? You know, I, I want to have the fictional part be able to stand on its own within that context. You could call that historical fiction. Anybody seen this? It says Finland is the world's happiest country. Again, 
And down here it says, John Helliwell, Richard Layard, and Jeffrey Sachs did research and they came up with, they do this every year. I've been living in Finland now for about 36 years. And if the Finns are happier than everybody else, I don't see it. <laughs> but I think I understand what they mean. I think it means if you live in a place where the respect for the rule of law has been in force since the time the country was established, where you knew, as one of my friends has said, that the Jews knew that if they didn't cross against the red light, nobody was going to come and grab them. If you have powerful enemies around you, you realize that you have to include everybody in your society so that you can mount a defense. You include all the people because you can't afford not to. It's maybe not that they're any better or any smarter than anybody else. That's just a necessity. That's what you do. You can think of it in terms of a platoon being somewhere out uh, on the front line and you send somebody out to, to stand watch at night. If you can't trust that he's going to stay awake and actually know if somebody's coming to get you, you're cooked. Same thing. You have to have everybody buy into the program to survive. If you have those two things, you can focus on solving real problems. You may have heard that Finland has a very good educational system. It's not an accident. They worked hard at it. They worked hard at it because they didn't have to spend a lot of time monkeying around with things that didn't matter. They were focused on building their economy, building their education, making a society where people didn't have to worry that if they got sick, they would suddenly become indigent and maybe not even be able to get medical attention. It's not a perfect place, but because of these things, it's a place that works. And I think that's what makes it the happiest. Thank you very much. I would be happy to answer questions if there are some. Could you tell me something about the origin of the Finnish language? He wants to know whether I can tell him something about the origin of the Finnish language. I wish I could. In fact, I, I don't think there's even a very clear understanding of what the origin of the Finnish language was among the experts. Uh -huh. It is a language that is, is related structurally to the Baltic languages and the Hungarian, and there are a bunch of little language pockets in, the, in Russia where people speak something that is, is related to it, but a Finn can't understand even what an Estonian is, is, is saying, much less a Hungarian. It's just the structure that is, is similar. Um, so actually, nobody really knows where it came from. They know that the Finns came from Europe, but their language may have come from the moon. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, I look forward to, read, to reading your book. I spent some time working at the American Embassy in Helsinki and also wrote a book about Finnish cooperatives. So I have four, four comments, minor comments. Uh, first of all, you mentioned the religion, the Protestant religion in Northern Europe is actually Lutheran. That's Everybody is Lutheran in Northern Europe or atheist. Uh, the second uh, comment is Marshall Mannerheim started his career as a bodyguard of the Tsar. That's, that's where he started. The third comment, 11% of, of Finland that was lost to the Soviets is actually called Karelia. And uh, it's a beautiful place with birch trees in the summertime. It's a really, really nice place to visit. So the, 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 the Finns obviously regret losing it. And the fourth uh, is about the continuation war, the thrust of the continuation war on part of the German was to lay siege to, to, to Leningrad, the 900-day siege of Leningrad in which two or three million uh, Russians died. So uh, 
that was really the strategic objective. And that's why they needed the themes to encircle, encircle uh, Leningrad. Well, that's, uh, uh, we can talk about that last one for quite some time. Um, certainly the siege of Leningrad was one of the really tragic parts of the, the, the war. Um, I would argue that really what, what the Germans needed was for the Finns to force the Soviets to keep a lot of troops along that long border. Finland has the longest border in Europe with any country that is bordering the uh, Russia or, or former Russian, former Soviet uh, countries. And they needed to keep a lot of Soviet troops in that sector so they weren't all down blocking the route into the Baltics and towards Berlin. Um, the, the siege of Leningrad, um, Mannerheim had promised to go as far as the Sphere River and he did. And the Germans came up from the bottom around Lake Ladoka and a corridor was left open by which the Soviets were able to send provisions into uh, Leningrad. Not enough, a lot of people starved. But the Germans kept saying to, to Mannerheim, you've got to come down and close that off and we're going to wipe out everybody in Leningrad. And Mannerheim, who understood that no matter what happened in that war, there would always be a Russia or a Soviet Union to the east, said, no, we promised to come this far, we came this far. You want to come up and close that off, that's your business, but we're not coming down. How many Jewish people lived in Finland at the end of the World War II, and how many are right now? 1,800 Finnish Jews at the end of World War II, plus, um, it was very interesting, in 1943, a few months after that tragic um, deportation of the eight who were sent to Auschwitz, Finland granted citizenship to 150 of the asylum seekers. Completely unheard of during the war for any country that was either an ally of, of Germany or fighting alongside Germany to do something like that. Clearly a gesture towards the West. Um, there were never more than 2,000 Jews in Finland and now the official numbers of those and depends a little bit how you define it, those who are, are members of congregations is down to 1,200. So severely diminished, not because of anti-Semitism, not because of, of uh, murders or it's because of intermarriage. It's a very orthodox community and it's very difficult if you intermarry then your spouse has to be willing to go through the entire process of conversion for you and your children to be able to be considered part of the community. Yes. The, the Jews that came, came back that were in the Russian army Czarist army came, came to live in Finland. How did they, how did, how did they remember their Jewishness? I've been asked that quite a few times, and of course I wasn't able to interview any of the Cantonists because they all were gone by the latter part of the 19th century. What he asked was, how did they remember their Jewishness? Um, it's a very good question. My assumption is the following. Um, in the shtetls, where they came from, yeah. there was no public schooling. Where did they study? If they studied at all, it was in a cheder. Right. They were given a very strong dose of repetitive learning of the Torah, of prayers, and at home, the same thing happened. They were, their parents taught them 
There was nothing else to teach them but Jewishness. And somehow, apparently, when they were taken away, when they had no family, when they had no home, they latched on to the one thing that they had, and that was the memory of their Jewishness. So as soon as they were allowed to begin to get together and congregate, one of the first things they did was they sent for a, a shochet, for a, a ritual butcher who could give them kosher meat. And that shochet almost always became a rabbi as well. So they would get someone to come in and support their religious training. Okay, I've got two more. Can I do two? That's the second question I always get one time, sooner or later. Where could they come from? They came from the pale. The men had been taken away, so the young women were looking around for husbands. They would send wagons down into the pale to go to different communities and say, we've got some marriageable aged men who were looking for marriageable aged women who would set up a, a Jewish home for them, would you come? And they brought the women back. And, and uh, was there, no, there were no migrations uh, after that of, of Jews there? Or those, uh, those uh, event the, eventually, of course, that there was a bit, but Finland is not the first place that Jews want to migrate to, <laughs> <laughs> except for me. <laughs> They, they became the, the, the root of the community. Yeah, um, thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit about your process for writing the book. Did you complete all the research first and then do a first draft? Or you know, did you, are you a night owl or a, an early bird? Like how, how, did you, how did you take the... I lived it for seven years. Um, I was always reading, always interviewing, always talking about it, and always writing. Um, it was not a, a very logical process. Um, part of it was I'd, I'd written quite a lot before, but I'd never written a novel. So all of that kind of grew out of my little by little getting to know these characters and being able to say, okay, it would be consistent that they would do X, Y, or Z. Um, but I had lots of trouble back and forth making sure, oh my gosh, was he really old enough to do this in 1874? You know, it, it, it was not a, an orderly process. But by living inside it, I eventually got to something I was willing to, to publish. And you can get it for $20, and I'd be happy to sign it and dedicate it to anybody who would like. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this is the end. I'll answer your question later.